Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Let's continue with our next session, next and last session of the day. I'm very sure everyone is going to enjoy it. Uh, we already know we're presenter because we had a chance to have another presentation from Lori yesterday. And I heard so many good comments that I'm very sure everyone will love today's presentation as well. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Lori. Lori has taught English as a foreign language for over 20 years. In 20, I'm sorry, for 20 years in different countries in South America. So imagine how much experience she's got and how much she has to share with us. Uh, I've also been a highly competitive academic merit scholarship program from her country. And of course, she creates being an ESL student in the United States at the beginning of her love relationship with languages and language teaching. Nice. And as a teacher, she has had the opportunity to teach children, teenagers, and adults as well as special needs learners. With a BFA from Washington University and CELTA TKT and Train of Trainer Cambridge certifications, she currently works as an academic consultant for Macmillan Education. It is an honor to have you back here, Laurie. Thank you very much for being part of our academic conferences this year. Thank you very much, Danielia. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And as I, you always say, I'm very excited to participate in these kind of conferences. So thank you very much. And are we ready to start? Yes. Here we go. Excellent. So today we're going to be talking about how to teach skills online. And it's a topic that I really, really like and I'm very excited to share with you. So let's get to it. And the first thing we are going to consider is a very simple question. And if you could write the answer using the comment section, what are the languages of skills? There are four skills. Can you type them up really quickly? So what are the skills? When we talk about the four skills, what are we talking about? So let's see if we can get some answers. Yeah, let's see. They are already typing while well, they are still grading you. Yeah. Everyone's was, really happy to have you. Hello, I was looking at the wrong place. I was like, why is this empty? Because I was in the wrong place. <laughs> I have to go to like comments. So there you are. Hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we have the four skills listening, writing, reading, and speaking. Very good. Now, next question. If you have to classify the skills, if you had to create two categories for the skills how would you divide them how would you divide the four skills in two categories and what are those categories can you write that in the mm -hmm. comment section right let's see where we get so if we had to classify the skills we divide them in two categories why would that be? Excellent. We have reading we and listening. Answer here. We have input and output. But that knowing that that isn't a correct answer, but I'm looking for the official answer. Input and output is a bit informal. Let's look for the official answer. What, what is that? Some people also say active and passive, and it's not that it's not correct. But we have to be careful how we refer to skills. So let's see if somebody can give me the correct way of talking. Excellent, Luis Vasquez. Receptive and productive. Very good answer. So why don't we say active and passive? Because when we refer to active and passive, it sounds like when you're reading or you're listening, you're not doing anything. You're a passive participant. And that's not what we want for our students. We want our students to be productive and being active all the time. So we divide them in receptive and productive. Receptive are listening and reading. Productive are speaking and writing. And then we have that all of these skills, when they are work together, when we use them together, they create fluency. So very good. So let's talk about our lessons. 
when we talk about lessons, we have receptive skills lessons and we have productive skill lessons, and they have a specific framework. So if we look at the stages of a receptive lesson, when we refer to the stages, we refer to the parts of a receptive lesson. Can you tell me what those three stages are? There are three stages or three parts to a receptive lesson. Can you tell me what they are? Let's see if we can get some answers. All right, interesting. Let's see the answers. Yes. Here. So let's see. What are the three stages or the three parts of a receptive lesson, of a reading lesson or a listening lesson? Reading or listening lesson. Oh. Uh, we have the first one. Mr. Pedro is saying pre, very good. Mm -hmm. What about the other two? Excellent, Miss Magdalena. Mm -hmm. yes. So we have mm -hmm. the pre, the while, and the post. Those are the three stages of a receptive lesson. And when we consider a lesson, we have to consider that the pre is where we create anticipation, we activate prior knowledge, and we help our students to make predictions. In the while stage, we're going to get our students to develop soft skills. And the post stage, even though this is a receptive lesson, we are going to end our lesson with a productive task. So they can do either a speaking or writing task. So these are the three stages. So let's look at the pre. And um, in the pre stage, we want our students to make predictions. We want them to personalize the topic. We want them to activate prior knowledge. And this is a very important part of the pre-stage. There is research that shows that when we're working with grown-ups and teenagers, they have the cognitive abilities to connect new knowledge to old knowledge. But when we're working with younger students, they don't have that ability. They need help connecting new knowledge and existing knowledge. So if we're working with younger students and if we're working with older students as well, it is very crucial to start our lessons by activating prior knowledge. Another thing we need to do is to use visible thinking routines. And a recommendation is to consider using TPR, digital resources, asynchronous learning to increase learning participation. So let's look at how we can do all of these things. I'm going to show you an example. This is from Academy Stars, and this is the title of the unit. And we're going to get our students to start making predictions by asking them who they think is the king of the forest. Way before we even start looking at the reading, we're going to start just by looking at the title. And we want our students to predict, in their opinion, who the king of the forest is. So I'm going to ask you, can you write in the comments, who is the king of the forest, in your opinion? Who do you think, Daniela? Who's the king of the forest? The lion. Okay. <laughs> so, Miss Daniela says the lion, which is a very popular answer. Yeah. Uh, Miss, Mr. Rodrigo ag agrees, the lion. What mm -hmm. about the rest of you? You also think lions are the king of the forest? <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> That's a good one. A bear could be the bear. A fox. Fox. Uh, that, that's <laughs> any other answers? Okay, so depending on the level of your students, you can start by asking them to make predictions. And if you want to take it farther, you can ask them why. For example, Miss Elizabeth says the biggest animal. So if they think the lion is the king of the forest, they can give reasons why. We're teaching adjectives. They can give reasons why. Or they can compare different animals, etc. So now we're going to actually look at the reading. And you won't be able to read because of the, of the streaming. But if you actually read the, the text, you're going to find out that according to the reading, the king of the forest the forest is the fox, as Miss Vangelina said. So we start by getting our students to 
make predictions, to get connected to the text. And I want to uh, show you this resource, which I really like, and it's something that you can use with your students. This is a resource called Polls Everywhere, and it allows you to create surveys and polls and interactive activities. So this is something that depending on your class structure and how much time you have, you can do in class, or you can ask your students to do before class, they can do it independently. If they're very young learners, they can do it with the help of mommy or daddy. If they're older students, more independent, they can do it on their own. So you can add an interactive digital resource to, to be part of your um, pre-stage. OK, so that's one way to create, uh, to help our students make predictions and to create engagement. But also, let's look at a different example. Aha, uh -huh, there you can see my screen. This is a reading, and this is for older students. This is from Speak Your Mind. And this is one that we can use for personalization. One part of the pre-stage is to create personal connections to the content, to the text, before we read it. So this one is social media profile tips. And I tell you something, I'm not very good at social media. I don't do Instagram, I don't do Twitter, I don't do any of those. So if I ask you, ask my students, before we read the text, what do you think is the number one tip you can give a person who is not very good at social media if they're going to create a profile? What would you tell them? Can you write it in the chat box? If it is a person like me who doesn't use Instagram, doesn't use Facebook, doesn't use anything really. <laughs> and I wanted to create a profile. What would be the tip you would give me? Why would you say it would be a good tip a good for a tip. social media useless person? Oh, probably one of the first tips people give is not to give all your personal information. Exactly, not, not to include, but that's where it gets confusing because it's a personal profile. So what comes exactly. to this personal information? Like, yeah, what about maybe not personal? Yeah, so what do you guys fun. think? What would you write as a, a social media profile tip? Okay, I think you're still typing your answers. Uh, I think the in the part of the personal information, probably it would be not your self number. Exactly. And it would also have to be very, we have to be very careful with the age thing, for example, and the age to the underage people who create these their profiles. And sometimes they tend to give all their information, even the specific address a specific phone number and that could be dangerous in many cases so here's a very interesting comment daniela javier says you are a millennial that is in your veins who is a millennial i'm a millennial <laughs> i'm 43 i'm not a millennial <laughs> okay so a good tool to use now i can end up this session right now we're finished somebody thinks i'm a millennial all our objectives are accomplished, <laughs> but no, seriously. So uh, another tool that I think you can use that can be very effective with your students is called Triceder. And this one is awesome because you don't have to create, uh, you don't have to create a profile. You don't have to create an account. You can just, I am having problems with my computer. Hold on. Give me one second. There is no problem. Okay, uh, she's going to be back in a moment. I'm really sorry. There was a little tiny inconvenience, but she is right here. Okay. Sorry about that. It disconnected for some reason. So let's restart it. So as I was saying, you can see it, but Triceder is a really good resource because it allows you to create a question and your students write their answers. And what I really like about it is that they get to be very active. They can give points to the different comments. They can write uh, 
pros and cons, so they can share their opinions about what their friends shared. And sorry about this, I don't know why it disconnected. So let's try that. There it is. Uh, but I'm guessing. Let's try again. Sorry about the interruption. Here we go. Now you can see me twice. <laughs> and there it is. So Daniela, can you see my screen? Excellent. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. Sorry about that. So as I was saying before we were interrupted, this is a really cool, uh, really good tool because as I said, your students can add their ideas, then can give votes, and they can write pros and cons for each of the ideas. So for example, don't include personal information. If you think that's a very good tip, your students can give a point. So this way you personalize the information, your students create a personal opinion and they create a personal connection to the text before reading the text. Okay, and here is another activity and this is a, a listening and this one is connected to Jules Burns and around the world in 80 days. And I'm gonna show you a tool that I'm sure you are very familiar with, but I think is awesome and it's being underused. Are you guys familiar with this, this chart? A KWHL chart? So I've been reading a lot about these charts because I'm a fan, I really like them. So I've been doing research and what I found out is that research tells us that this kind of chart is not effective. But here's the thing. It's not that the chart is not effective, it's that we as teachers are not using it correctly. We ask our students to fill out the information, we tell them to fill out the case, to fill out the Ws, maybe even to fill out the L, but we don't get them to think about it. So when we ask our students to think about what they know about a topic before they encounter the topic, we have to stop and make them compare the information and see if what they think they know is correct information. So that's where they can have a conversation and compare. Maybe they think that Lance Armstrong was the first man on the moon. So they need to check to see if what they know is actually correct information. When they fill the, the column where they write what they want to know or what they wonder, Later in the learning process, they have to go and check and see if they got the answers. I wonder this, did I learn that information? Did I actually get that information or I still have the question? When they complete the information in the, in the column where it says learned, they should compare that with what they know and see if there were some misconceptions and now they have the correct information. So this is a very useful chart that if you use it correctly, it's going to be very effective in creating a student engagement and a student metacognition and student meta learning. But as I said, is when we say that the chart is not effective, the problem is not the chart, it's the way we're using it. So we have to be very aware of how we are using a KWHL chart. And so for example, as I said before, this, this reading, I, I went the wrong direction, hold on. This, this reading was about their, wait. This, this listening was about Jules, Jules Burns and around the world in 80 days. So if we ask our students to feel what they know, they can tell you, well, he's a writer, there was a movie, 
obviously is 80 days and then they can fill out what they want there, how they can get more information and what they learned. So I seriously recommend this chart used correctly. So before we move on, any questions so far? How are we doing? How is it going? I'm going to quickly. No, I think it's going. We're doing good? Because uh, it's lots of yes. information. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, but the chat is very interesting. And I think uh, we have several teachers saying that, no, they didn't know about this. But I'm very sure we will be using it now. We will be applying okay. Excellent. So now I want to tell you about one of my favorite strategies. Are you guys familiar with the visible thinking routines? Has anybody used visible thinking routines before or heard about visible thinking routines? Can you write yes or not in the comments? Okay, so I'm going to move on, but visible thinking routines are part of a project by Harvard University called Project Zero, and it's based on three different ideas. The first idea is that students need to be taught different thinking dispositions. We don't think always in the same way, and we have different ways of thinking. So we have to teach our students those different thinking dispositions. And one way to do it is by creating routines that have steps that they can easily follow. The second part of visible thinking routines is that thinking is a very much uh, invisible activity. There is no clear evidence to the thinking process. So when we want our students in class, we want them to become aware that their thinking is valuable and that their thinking is has evidence and it is visible. So that's how we have the thinking visible routines. And this example is from a series that we have that is called Global Stage. And before students do the reading, they first practice a visible thinking routine. And this is a very simple one. It has three steps. See, think, wonder. So let's do an experiment. This is an experiment that I do. Sorry, Lori. I'm very sorry. Before we do the nice experiment that I'm sure we will have, there was a question from Rosario. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And I'm actually not sure what she re what she means by the dye technique. So maybe if she could uh, explain what she means by the dye technique, but. D-I-E technique, and um, I'm not sure that I know what, what Ms. Rosati is talking about. So if you can talk a little bit about it, maybe I can say. Okay, so let's do the experiment. It's very simple. You have a picture, yes? Can you write in the comments what you see? That's it, that's what I want you to write, what you see in the picture. So go ahead, let's do an experiment. What do you see in the picture? Mm, describe, imagine, and evaluate. Okay, it could be one of the, yeah, visible thinking routines. Yes. Okay, so what do you see in the picture? There's a tent inside a room. Mr. Javier, very good. What else? Mm -hmm. You could see father and a son. Aha, uh -huh. father and a son. Very good. What else? Yeah, yeah that's another comment that we have father, son, time. Uh-huh, father sometime. What else? A boy and his father, a father teaching something to his son. Mm -hmm. Let's wait for one more comment. And then we a uh, dad and his son. So here's my question. Do you see a father and a son? How do you know that he's a father and he's the son? How do you know he's not the older brother, younger brother, stepfather? neighbor, step uh, babysitter, <laughs> power, <laughs> so 
this is why we teach thinking dispositions because what you see and what you think are not the same thing and it's very important for students to be able to differentiate that because when what we think affects what we see that's when we get prejudices stereotypes etc so question what do you see no what do you think you think it's a father and a son but what do you see oh, okay. well, what do we see yeah. let's see if somebody writes what they see reading a book good exactly miss elizabeth you imagine they are father or son but that's not what you see so so this is one of the a tent a man a boy a book a nice lamp so that's why it's important to teach the different uh thinking routines because then we get our students to to see to think to wonder and to learn different dispositions then you would go to the next one where we'd ask them what do you think and it's a very important step to get your students to give evidence so why do you think it's a father and a son why do you think this is the living room this is the bath bathroom this is it why and then we move on to the next one and because they look alike for example and then we move to the next one and what do you wonder and when we get to what do you wonder it's very important because that's where we invite our students to go from what is visible to what they don't know and they want to explore i wonder if it is a tradition i wonder if it is an interesting book etc so these are uh, these are routines that you can use with all level of students so here you have a, an example from very young students using uh, see, think, wonder. You can also use another routine where you get your students to use question starts. So they can ask questions with what, where, who, when. And that starts that wondering process. Why is this happening? Where is this happening? Who are these people? Another uh, routine that you can use is called step inside. And here you ask students to look at the situation from the perspective of one of the people in the picture. So in this case, they can choose uh, either one of the rules or they can choose the little girl and try to see the situation from those different perspectives. But you don't only have to use it with young students. You can use it with older students as well. And here we have an example. This is from Insta English. So if you do see, think, wonder, you can ask your students what they see, what they think, and what they wonder using a unit opener from one of the from one of the units or a different unit opener. So you can use different resources for different levels of students. Any questions so far? Any How are we doing? Good? Yes, I think everything is really clear and it's really good. No, we don't have any questions. Okay. Just one comment from teacher Monica Vargas who said, so it is similar to the diet technique based on what they uh, I think diet technique might be one of the visible thinking routines. And there is a book called Making Thinking Visible, which was created by Harvard University. And I really recommend that you read it because you're going to find lots of information there. It's very exciting. And I think uh, Jai is part of that. Okay, so that covers the green stage. And let's move on to why. And we're in the wild stage. Can you hear me? I hear a lot of echo. Yes, yes, there is. How about now? Better. Yes? It's just, yes, now it is better. Okay, so in the wild stage, we're going to develop the soft skills. And if you do research, you're going to find that there are lots of soft skills and lots of classifications and lots of categories. But we're going to look at what CELTA tells us are the soft skills. So here you have uh, the soft skills of reading and listening. And some of them are reading for GIST or global understanding 
reading for detail, scheming and scanning, deducing meaning from context, predicting, uh, inferring attitude, mood and feeling, understanding the organization of the text, understanding discourse markers, and note-taking. A key element of teaching online is deciding what our students can do independently and what we need to do in class because class time is very limited and teaching online requires for students to work on their own. So when we decide what our students can do independently and what needs to be done in class, we have to consider three factors. We have to consider the aim of the task, the age of our students, and the level of our students. Those are the three factors, aim, level, and age. So if you look at these uh, sub-skills, which ones do you think we absolutely have to do in class? Our students can't do independently it has to be done in class. Can you write it very quickly in the comment section? Out of these sub skills, which one has to absolutely must be done in class? We cannot ask our students to do it independently. What do you think? Out of these sub skills, which one you think our students have to do it in class? Well, we don't have any responses yet. We don't have any answers it's yet. Probably because of the size, we cannot read completely. Probably it's very small. Okay. So let me ask you a question. For example, can I ask my students to do prediction independently or is that something that we need to do in class? Listening, but depends, can we, they have to do it in class? So let's talk about it. Miss Paula says, listen. Yeah, it's actually, it's standard size, but it looks very small when you, you stream it. So. Let's say that we want our students to do a listening for GIST or global understanding. If we want our students to do listening for GIST or global understanding, how many times can they listen to the text? If it, we are asking them for listening for GIST or global understanding, how many times should they listen to the text? Exactly, Miss Leslie, prediction can be done independently, exactly. So, if we want our students to listen for GIST, we want them to listen to the text once or twice, depending on, on the level. Is there a way for you to control how many times they are going to do a listening if you ask them to do it for homework? No. So, if you're doing an activity like listening for GIST, this is an activity that you need to do in class because you need to be able to control that they are going to do the activity in the correct way which is listening once or twice and getting the general sense of the activity but if i'm asking my students to listen and to answer questions about specific details they might need to listen more times they might need to listen three four five seven times depends on the student that is something that they can do independently. Let me show you an example from a reading. This is from Insta English. And in this reading, the first activity, they are asked to scheme the article and answer a very sim uh, two simple questions. If this is a typical young man and in which ways he is not typical. When we ask our students to scheme an article, how long should it take them? How many minutes do they need to scheme an article? What do you think? Yeah. 
if we want them to do a scheming, how long should they, how many minutes should we give them to scheme the article? Let's see what we don't really have the time here. Some okay. seconds. Okay, seconds might be too, <laughs> seconds might be too little, but definitely it should be a very short time. So one to two minutes. So if we're asking our students to do scheming, can you ask them to do it for homework? No. Can they do it independently? No, because we need to make sure that they are doing it between two and three minutes. But what about if we have the next activities where they have to answer specific but questions about specific details, and they have to find words and phrases in the text. How long do you think students need to answer five questions looking for specific information or to find vocabulary words in the test and find the definition? How long do you think it would take in on average your students? Give me like an average, according to the length of the test, but Let's kind of guess this is a text and they have to answer five questions and then they have to do vocabulary questions. How long do you think that's going to take them? And consider your faster students, but also consider your slower students. So how long is that going to take on average? Let's see if we get some answers. Miss Carla says six to eight minutes. Miss Zulma says five minutes. Ms. Mr. Rodrigo says five to 10 minutes. Some people say 15 minutes. So if your class time, your online class time, it's a very limited time, is it productive to spend 15 of those minutes waiting for students to read? And what are the students who are faster going to do while you wait for the younger students to finish? And is it something that they can do independently? So we have to consider, as I said, the three factors, aim of the activity, level of the students, and age of the students. If this is an activity that requires close reading, attentive reading, and it's going to be time consuming, they can do it independently. That way, the student who does it very quickly is done and is not waiting for anybody. The student who's going to take longer has the freedom to do it at their own pace. And then your class time can be more productively used doing an activity like the final activity of the class, which is a conversation where they're going to compare ideas, they're going to be productive, they're being, going to be speaking and generating ideas. So this is a key question that we have to ask ourselves when we plan our classes. Which activities are, our students can do independently? Which activities are more productive and more effective if they do it on their own, which activities require support and need to be done in class. What about if we're working with a very young set of students and they're doing Ferris wheel, which is a, uh, is a series for preschool. And remember the three factors. We said the aim, the level, and the age. Those are what we need to consider if we want our students to work in class or independently. So in this case, the aim is to develop literacy. We want our students to enjoy a story, to be able to identify the characters, to understand what's happening. They are very young students and the level is very low. Do you think this is an activity that they can do independently or we have to do in class? What do you think? Let's see if we have some answers. Independently or in class? Well, 
Well, we don't have answers and we have a short time. So this is an activity because of the aim, the level of our students and the age of our students we need to do in class. And then we can ask them to practice at home. Well, they're at home. They can practice on their own with mommy and daddy and have independent work. So as I mentioned before, in class, everybody says in class, excellent. That is the correct answer. They have to do it in class because of those three reasons. So that moves us to the post part of our lessons. And this is where receptive skills and productive skills get together because the last part of a receptive lesson has to be a productive task. So let's look at what a productive lesson is going to be like. A productive lesson is where we develop reading, uh, writing and speaking. And this is from Gateway Second Edition. And one of the wonderful things is that this is a textbook example of a lesson, a writing lesson framework. So if you look at this lesson, you're going to see all the stages of a writing lesson, beginning with the leading, that's where we introduce the topic, we activate prior knowledge, we get our excited, uh, our students excited about the topic, then the second part is a reading. A quick question, why do you think we have a reading as part of a writing lesson? Can you write it in the comments? Why do we have a reading as part of a writing lesson? Let's see if we have some ideas. Yes, Miss Carola, you are answering, but I cannot see them. You're totally right. So let's wait a bit longer to see if we get answers. Why do we need a reading in a writing lesson? While you answer that, I'm going to show you the other stages. We have language preparation. We have content preparation. Excellent, Miss Pao, Miss Marta. And we have writing. So we have vocabulary, backup information, different points of view, vocabulary as a model. So all of those are the correct answer. It is a model and in that model they're going to find vocabulary, they're going to find information, they're going to find uh, language conventions. So the reading is a model, exactly. They can copy the style, exactly. So if our, we are asking our students to write a formal letter, they need to know what a formal letter looks like. If we're asking them to write an informal email, they need to see what an informal email looks like. So that's why we have the reading. Then we have content preparation and language preparation. In the language preparation, we're going to give them vocabulary, useful phrases, language conventions. In content preparation, they're going to have the opportunity to think about what they want to say. And then we have the actual writing task. So my question is, which of these stages can students do independently? Which of these stages our students can do on their own, out of class, independently. What do you think? What do you think? Any ideas which of these stages we can answer to the writing itself, obviously, having our students doing the writing and we're just waiting around. The post reading and the reading, the whole reading, they can do on their own. There's no reason why you have to do it in class. They can do the reading, make notes, circle vocabulary. So these are things that we have to consider which of these activities are going to be more productive independently so our class time is more effective and now if you look at this lesson which as i said is a textbook lesson what do you think is the stage that is not here and is crucial 
is a stage that is missing and is almost more important than everything else. And I'm going to give you a clue. Starts with an F. F as in Fabiola. What do you think is the stage that is not here? There's one stage that is missing from this lesson. Starts with an F as in Fernando. What do you think? Yes, you can answer the comprehension questions as homework. That's very good. Absolutely. You can. Excellent, Miss Monica. Very good feedback. So we have to consider, and research shows that when students have an audience, when they are going to have somebody looking at their work, they tend to do a bigger effort. They work harder. So we have to create within our online classes and in a real face-to-face -face classes as well as part where they have an audience and they have real feedback. So uh, let's jump. Please. I think I'm missing a slide. Anyway, so here is where we need to use resources such as Google Drive or Google Classroom or any other kind of resource. So our students have a real audience. And I'm going to show you an example from a share it where you can also see a writing lesson. And I want to show it to you because if you look at the bottom, this lesson has the feedback included. Here, the last part of the lesson, after they have the model, they do the content preparation, the language preparation, and the writing, they have a built-in feedback session where they read their email to a friend and they get feedback. So this part, the feedback part, is something that you need to build time in your class. If you're going to do it in pairs, you need to build time so students have the opportunity to have actual audience and actual feedback. OK, and that takes us to a speaking lesson. And a speaking lesson has a very similar framework. It has a model, it has language preparation, content preparation, and the actual task. So I don't know if this is too small, but let's see if we can do it. Where do you think you find the model? Is it one, two, three, six, or seven? Which one is the model for the speaking activity? I can see it on my screen, so I think maybe you can see it on yours too. Where would you find the model? Is it activity one, two, three, six, or seven? What do you think? Any ideas? We find the model in activity. I think we have a bit of a delay, so I cannot see your answers yet. Excellent, Miss Carla! Woohoo! Yes! So we have a video that is going to function as the model. What about content preparation? Ms. Wal Mr. Walter says six. But Mr. Walter, number six is content preparation, language preparation, or the model? What do you think? Where would we find content preparation? Which activity is content preparation? Let's wait and see. Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that number six is content preparation and then number two and three are language preparation. So again, I have to consider which of these stages my students can do independently. For example, this is a flipped classroom lesson. That means that our students can engage with the content before class. So they can watch the model, which is the video, on their own. They can take, make notes. They can uh, get ideas about vocabulary. And then when you come to class, they are already prepared. Same thing. You can do content preparation independently. You can have your students do their own brainstorming. Exactly, number six, very good. 
Our students can do the content preparation independently. They can do their own brainstorming. And when they come in class, they work in pairs and have conversations. So I want to recommend, in case you haven't used it yet, Flipgrid. I love Flipgrid for many reasons. But the main reason is because when we ask our students to record a video, they're never happy with the first one. They're never going to be satisfied with the first take. So they're going to do it over and over and over. They're going to repeat the process at least two or three times. And that is practice and that is production. And that's what we want. Also, this is an audience. You are giving your students an audience because they are going to be able to see each other's videos. And you're going to give them the uh, the possibility of real feedback because they're going to be able to see their own video and their classroom classmates videos so you have an audience you have production you have practice and you have real feedback so this is a resource that is very good and that you should consider using so to finish i want to remind you that when we use our class time to really develop the skills when we go beyond grammar and vocabulary and we start looking at skills and working on reading speaking and listening and writing we really develop fluency and fluency is communication that's what we want for our students we want their ability to communicate so take the time to really think about the frameworks and to think about how to use those frameworks in on an online environment in a way that becomes really effective and productive. And I'm sorry, I went a little bit over time. I have like five, I took a little bit of extra time. So if you have any questions. Yeah, that was perfect. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I think there are no questions so far. Let's wait a little bit longer. Anyway, it was a very nice presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Everything was really useful, very interesting. A lot of things I have learned a lot personally. That's good. This is a topic that I really like. This, well, actually, I like lots of topics, but this one in particular, I, I really like. And I think we have to be more flexible in the way we think now that we're working online and our class time is limited. So we have to start thinking of ways of making our students independent so our class time can be more productive. Exactly. No questions. Excellent. That's good. <laughs> no, you're very welcome. This was a pleasure. I, so I'm going to share with you my information one more time. So if I can help you with anything, if there's anything that you need that you think we might be able to provide, please make sure to write, make sure to contact us because we are here to help. We really, really want to support teachers. We know it's not an easy time. So let us know if we can help you in any way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie. Always presentations are really, really good. And I think, yes, everyone is just like very grateful for this presentation. Very and exciting. Uh, I am going to share my screen. Just Should I stop sharing my panel? Okay. Don't worry, it's already done. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of the CBA, I would like to thank you again for having, for giving us this great presentation. Yesterday's presentation was awesome, and today's thank presentation you. was also really awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, we would like, of course, to give you our your certificate. Uh, so exciting. <laughs> yes, your you. second certificate in this academic conferences. One more, one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you for presenting this great webinar. It was really nice, really useful, and I'm very sure we have all learned a lot. Thank you for sharing all your valuable knowledge. No, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so then that will be all. Thank you very much, Laurie. And I have, thank you, see you here. I have already posted the attendance. 
Yeah, I have already posted the attendance. So please don't forget to fill out the attendance form. 